I am not unaware of the time. I can do a brief devotional or I can do the sermon. And since I work so hard in the sermon, I'm going to do that. Amen. <laughs> but I will try to make it a little short. Through Jesus, we have received grace and discipleship. For obedience to the faith among all peoples, for his name's sake, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you recognize the name James Montgomery Flags? You do? What do you know him from? History. From history? All right. <laughs> Ten points for you. All right. Very few people know his name, but we're very familiar with his work. He was born in the either late 1800s, early 1900s, probably late 1800s, it would have to be. World War I broke up, and he was too old to go into, into the service, so he decided to help out as he could, and he, he was an illustrator for many magazines. And then at the very start of World War I, he decided he needed to help, so he, he, he put together an illustration and went to the to the government and said, can we print these? And they printed over four million of them, distributed them all over the United States. And you might recognize this famous poster. <laughs> now what was interesting was when World War II broke out, that poster came back and it was used and it was very, uh, it was, had an impact both in World War I and World War II to get people to sign up. Today we are going to recognize that we are involved in a very important war. We call it the Great Controversy. And we are going to look at Jesus' recruiting statement. Because Jesus wants you. Yes, he wants you because he wants to save you. He wants you because he wants you to, to be in heaven with him. But he also has called you and he has saved you to serve. And so we're going to look at a very familiar passage. We often refer to it as the Great Commission. And if I were to ask you how the Great Commission begins, what would you say? Well, let's look at where we usually start what we call the Great Commission, what we usually read or think of. And I asked Genevieve Thomas to read Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and though I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Thank you, Genevieve. We usually start with go, therefore. But how have we understood that? I really think most of us have understood it in terms of go into the world. Go into the world. That means the Great Commission is about leaving home and going elsewhere. Right? Let's be honest. And it says making disciples of all nations. So that means going to other countries. And I don't think that's exactly what Jesus had in mind. And if we do think about going into the world that doesn't know Jesus... We usually think about going into our communities, but again, for the most part, we think that's the role of evangelists and pastors, to go into the world. The mission movement was started in the 1700s, basically, and one of the very first ones was William Carey, who went to India. Another very famous one was Hudson Taylor, who went to China, and in the Adventist church, it was J.N. Andrews, who went to Europe to take the Adventist message to Europe. And so we think about big names as those who go out. That's not what Jesus had in mind, I do not believe. The Great Commission can only be understood when we include verses 16 through 20. 
And John Thomas is going to read that for us. The eleven disciples went into Galilee to the hillside to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, though some had doubts. Then Jesus approached them and told them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you go, disciple people in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you each and every day until the end of the age. Some may say, but Pastor Gary, he's talking to the disciples, and he's starting the church, and they're going to be going out to the then-known world. I think it's bigger than that. In fact, Ellen White has a quote about who that commission applies to. She says, the Savior's commission includes all believers to the end of time. It is fatal to suppose that the work of saving others depends on the ordained minister alone. For this work, the church was established, and all, all who take the, its vows pledge themselves to be co-workers with Christ. Whatever our calling in life, our first interest should be to win others for Christ. Whatever our calling, whatever we do. So the question then becomes, how do we carry out Jesus' command to go and make disciples? Well, we're going to look at this command, and we're going to look at some key words that, that may be a different way of looking at them, of understanding how they should be translated or could be translated might help us. And the first thing we're going to notice is that we carry the great commission when we are in the presence of Jesus. That's how we carry out the command. We, we carry out the great commission when we are in the presence of Jesus. Verse 16 said, The eleven disciples went to the mountain in Galilee where Jesus had told them to go. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, when it talks about Jesus going out into the wilderness or Jesus going out into the mountain, what was he always doing there? He was always praying. He invited them to come with him to a place of prayer. It was in the mountain, in the wilderness, that Jesus got his marching orders, if you will, from his father as to what he was to do that very day. That's why he knew who he should see and who he could, could stop as he's on the way somewhere else and, and spend time with people. He invited them to be with him in the mountain where he prayed. And then at the end, verse 20, it says Jesus promised to be with them always. To try and do the, and obey and follow and, and take part in the great commission of, of helping others become disciples without spending time in the presence of Jesus is trying to accomplish the impossible. Do you recognize that? I, I know thinking about witnessing is scary. I confess. I know thinking that I don't have the gifts and abilities is tempting. Jesus didn't give you and me that option. He didn't say, go if you feel like it. He didn't say, go if you want to. He didn't say, go if you know you're going to be successful. He just said, go. Go. But, but I want you to notice an interesting response of the disciples. It says in verse 17, when they saw him, they bowed down in worship, though some had doubts. And notice I put the word hesitated in brackets. That, that's really a better translation. It's not that they doubted and disbelieved Jesus, but they hesitated. Now, many commentators believe that in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Paul, in talking about the resurrection, mentioned that there was a time when 500 people, 500 disciples, followers, met with Jesus. And they believe that that's what, that's what took place here. And Ellen White supports that. But what's interesting is Matthew is referring specifically to the 11 when he said some doubted. Now, I, I don't think the disciples doubted that Jesus was resurrected. After all, this took place after the upper room experience. It took place after the experience on the beach when Jesus brought them back into uh, and, and recalled them as disciples. But it took place before the ascension when Jesus, when they said to Jesus, are you going to establish your kingdom now? In other words, what they're hesitating about is they have no clue 
what the death and resurrection means to them as disciples. What are they going to do now? That's the hesitation. And I think that that's the hesitation is brought out by what Jesus said to them in the very next verse. But before that, I think we need to look at why we hesitate. Studies have shown that there are some common fears that all of us have. There's the fear of being alone. And you can be in a crowd and be alone, right? If you think you're the only one, if you think people have put you off, you can be in a crowd and be alone. There is the fear of illness, and we experience that a great deal during COVID. There is the fear of rejection. There's the fear of death and there's the fear of failure. As I look at this list, when it comes to witnessing, the fear of being alone could be there. What if people isolate me because I witness? And we need to be careful and witness wisely and not just hit people over the hammer with what it means to be saved or who God is. But, but because there's a fear of being alone, That could apply to us. There's fear of rejection. No one likes to be rejected. And if we witness, we may come to a time when we may face persecution if we witness. Last September, I had the privilege of going to Nigeria to speak to a group of non Adventist pastors. And they told me stories about their persecution where they saw family members killed for their faith. It didn't stop them from witnessing. In fact, It caused them to witness even more. And then there's the fear of failure. And that's perhaps the biggest fear we all have when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission. What if they don't accept? What if I say the wrong thing? What if, what if, what if? Jesus didn't say, go and make disciples only if you can be successful. In fact, he didn't even say, go and make disciples. What? Let me, let me read to you, let me read to you another way of putting it. I, I skipped over one slide. Wait a minute, let's, let's go back a bit. We carry out the Great Commission in the authority of power of Jesus. We need to keep that in mind. We carry out the Great Commission in the authority and power of Jesus. The word authority means power, but what's interesting, it means the power that enables you to accomplish that which you set out to do. We are to witness under God, Jesus' authority, which is over all the earth, and we witness with the realization that he is enabling us to do what he asks us to do. Jesus came near to them and told them. I love that statement. Jesus didn't just stand off afar and say, go. He came near to them and said, go with, I'm going with you, and I'm going to empower you. And I want you to notice how he put it. All authority in heaven and on earth has given, been given to me. Therefore, because I am going to give you the power, therefore you can go. But I want to, to just reread verses 19 and 20 because we are to carry out the Great Commission when we go according to Jesus' plan. What was Jesus' plan? Now, I've taken some words and they're highlighted in different colors. And this is a way they can be translated that will enable us to understand Jesus' plan more. Therefore, as you go. It's a participle. And it means, the reason it it says it that way, as you go or in your going or wherever you go, that must take place before you can make disciples. You've got to decide to go. And you've got to decide that wherever you go, you are going to be looking for opportunities to speak a word for Jesus, to do an act for Jesus, to to help people see who God is. In order to do that, you've got to be spending time with God. I think it was called abiding a couple weeks ago. Right? And so, as you go, whether it's to the marketplace, to your next-door neighbor, to work, or if you are elderly and you've got limited ability to go, you can always go into your room and pray. As you go, in your going, 
disciple people. It doesn't say make disciples. It says as you go, disciple people. That doesn't mean you've got a set regiment of things you're going to do to disciple. It means because you are a disciple of Jesus, whatever you do is going to be discipling others, even if you aren't aware of it at times. It's not about you making disciples because you can't. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But it puts a priority on making sure that people are brought to Jesus first. In your going, make disciples. In your going, disciple others. Share your own journey with others. He goes on. Disciple people of all nations. Most translations say nations, and so we think countries. The word nations can simply mean people. And of course, in, in, in Jesus' day, there was just two groups of people. There were the Jews and there were the Gentiles. And the word for Gentiles, they use the word nations. He's not talking about going to countries necessarily. He's saying you are to disciple people. Because nations aren't the criteria for who God wants to save. He doesn't save nations he saves people. He calls people. He goes on. Immersing them. The, the word is usually baptism, and we think automatically of just the act of baptism, the baptismal rite, and we should. That's there. But the word baptism literally means immerse. And we're to immerse them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. That word name means character. Now think about this. Discipling comes down to this. We are immersing people in the character of God. We'll come back to that in a few moments. We are immersing people in the character of God. And it's after we immerse them in the character of God that we teach them to keep in mind everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you every day until the end of the age, until Jesus comes back. Does that help you understand in a different way the commission Jesus gives us? It's not about sending people out somewhere else, although that's part of it. Because in, in just a, a short period of time, Jesus would tell his disciples just before his ascension, you're to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and on to the ends of the world, right? So it does include going elsewhere. But primarily... It's about in your going day to day. Be intentional, intentional about discipling, about living out your life as a disciple in such a way that others will want to be disciples too. So, if the main goal of the Great Commission is to make disciples, the question becomes, what is a disciple? We usually think of the disciple as being the twelve. But I would remind you that Jesus had many disciples other than the twelve. And he called them disciples. I would also remind you that he's called all of us to be disciples. Because the word disciple means follower. It means a follower who will teach others what they have learned from their mentor. There's a book that I read some time ago called The Great Omission by Dallas Willard. And that, that title came from the fact that he said the, the problem is in evangelical churches, we focus on making people members, not making them disciples, and there's a difference. And I think we as Adventists can say sometimes we do that too. You can be a member without being a disciple, but you're not going to be a disciple without being a member. I think that's absolutely true. But here's what he said a disciple is. I think it's a great definition. A disciple is a learner, a student, an apprentice of Jesus. Disciples of Jesus are people who do not just profess certain views as their own, but apply their growing understanding of life in the kingdom of heavens to every aspect of their life on earth. If we do seek him, he will certainly find us. And then we ever more deeply find him. That is the blessed existence of disciples of Jesus who continuously grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are called to be a disciple. 
And then he says, baptize them or immerse them in the name or character of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, there's a bunch of words there. You can't read them all. But if you go through the Bible and look at every name that God has given, been given, every name that Jesus has been given, every name the Holy Spirit has been given, every activity, every metaphor, we are called to immerse people in the character of the God we know and love. And if we give our doctrinal beliefs simply as this is what God is, is God's truth without helping them see it's really the truth about God. So when we give the three angels' message, it's not just about warning them that a judgment's coming. It's not just about telling them to come out of Babylon. It's not just about telling them they better worship on the right day in the right way. It's really about telling them there is a God who wants to make sure that your, his character is placed within you. It's about a God who says, I don't want you in Babylon trying to figure out how you can save yourself. It's about God who says, I created a special day to have a special relationship with you, and I want that day honored because I'm honoring it. I'm still blessing that day. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so, we are to immerse people in the character of God, teaching them to do everything I command you. The summary of what it means to be, have ongoing dis discipling of others is found in teaching them to do everything I've commanded you. Now, of course, that includes all of the Bible, no doubt. But as we were, as Pastor Ben shared with us a few weeks ago, in John 14 through 16, Jesus commanded specific things just before he was going to die on the cross. He commanded them to abide, he commanded them to love one another, and he commanded them to bear fruit. And if you think about those three things, including our doctrines, they are summed up in those three things. What's interesting is that we live in a very different world today than just a few years ago. And we're going to have to do ministry and do discipling somewhat different if we're going to reach people with the gospel. I, I did some research, and I'm going to share this very briefly with you. I want, I want you to see that we have an overwhelming task we have an overwhelming task if we're going to disciple people. I want you to look at the religious trends in North America. I know this is kind of small on the screen. But in two, 1972, 90% of Americans, that's that blue dot at the top, 90% of Americans said that they were Christian. 4% said they were from other religions, and 5% considered themselves non-religious. Ten years later, 1982, 89% still considered themselves Christians. 7% considered themselves non-religious and 4% other religions. 1992, 87%, a decline but not by much. 7% still considered themselves non-religious and 4% still considered themselves, and I think I might have been off one on each, it might have been eight and five, it was hard to tell from the chart, okay? In 2002, 6% declined, 81% considered themselves religious or Christians. 16%, a jump of 9 percentage point, considered themselves non-religious. And 5% were from other religions other than Christianity. In 2012, now 77% considered themselves Christians. 20% considered themselves non-religious. And 6% are from other religions. And the last data I could find was 2,000. Notice the decline, 77% to 63% now consider themselves Christians. 29% consider themselves non-religious. And again, 7% from other religious beliefs, Islam, uh, Baha'i, whatever. I believe if we were to take that poll again, the decline would be even greater and the increase in other religions would be greater as well. We have an overwhelming task. And not to discourage you, but to remind you that if we're going to do the work Jesus has called us to do, it's going to take all of us and it's going to take the Holy Spirit at work. Notice the next slide. I looked up our community 
and it's too small for me to read. I forgot to print that one out. But the top one is our church, and we are not 16%, 0.16% of the community surrounding us, 0.16%. Overall, in, in the four, uh, four cities around us, Laguna Niguel, uh, San Clemente, uh, Laguna Beach, and Dana Point. I should have probably included um, Mission Viejo. 185,310 in those communities. If we were to apply the number of people, that percentage from 2000, the year to, 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 uh, 2000, if we were to apply that percentage of 63%, there are 68,565 who consider themselves Christians. If we were to look up those, I'm sorry, there's 116,000 who consider themselves Christians. If we were to look up those who are not Christians or non-believers or other faiths, it's 68,565. We're not going to reach them all by ourselves. And certainly the pastor and people are not going to come banging on the door to come to church. We'll talk about that in a moment. The task is overwhelming. And to put our heads in the sand as if it's not there is going to accomplish nothing. We are called to serve, and we are all called to reach out and disciple others. There was a book written by a man named Dan Greer, Gear called The Church Scatter. It was written after the COVID uh, experiment, the COVID experiment, the COVID uh, pandemic. And he said that things have changed in the church and we must seek out the lost where they work and live because they're not coming to our churches for an event any longer. Statistics have borne him out. We are to seek them out. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? What does this mean? What this means is, is that we will seek every opportunity to disciple people in a variety of ways. Yes, we will offer to pray with them. You may be surprised and how many people are willing for you to pray for them in times of crisis, whether they believe in God or not. I have seldom been rejected when I've offered to pray with people. We, we may offer to study the Bible with them. I, I, and that's a good thing, but we must recognize that many of the nuns out there who don't claim any religious affiliation want nothing to do with the Bible. They say, if it's good for you, fine. But you've got to come up with another way, and another way is your own testimony. We need to be willing to hang out with people, and we need to be there when people are hurting. We must change our methods. It cannot be just one catch all come to church and we'll teach you and train you, but going to where people are and asking God to bring us into the situations where we can share the love of God has had for us. And let them know that's the love he wants them to have too. So what does this mean? It means that we need to keep verse 20 in mind as we ask God to give us the desire that in our going we will disciple others. We must remember that Jesus is with us always to empower us and to enable us to do the work he's asked us to do. And he will be with us until he comes again.